thank you so much, guys. You're a big help. And you know what? You guys are getting better all the time. Okay? I have a question for you guys today. How many guys know how to play the piano? Anyone else like that? You guys can't? No? You good? You can't play? How many guys know how to play the violin? No, 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 me, me, you? Yeah, you do? Okay, I'll ask your mom later, okay? How many guys know how to play soccer? Yeah, you know how to talk? You like soccer? Kick the ball around? And how many guys know how to play tennis? Man, you do everything. Anthony does, does everything, okay? Huh? Tennis is that, with that racket, and you hit the ball, Back and forth, yeah, 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 back and forth, back and forth, okay. I, I remember, um, I remember I gave, yes, Madison. Kind of like badminton, yeah, but on a tennis court, right. Um, but when my daughter was six years old, we gave her um, violin lessons, okay. Um, you know, at six, violin, uh, um, earplugs are great investment. Um, you know, about a year or so of practice, it's just, yeah, some inter interesting sounds. I'm like, good job, honey. Um, but you know what? You know what, though? When she got to be 16 years old, she was really good at it. You know, she's like, wow, playing some really beautiful, it sounded really nice, okay? And you know what, though? You know how you get from... Sounds to being really nice. You know what it takes? You know what it takes? A lot of practice. And faith, yeah. It took her an hour of practice every day, six, five days a week, to get anywhere. And I remember when I was in, when I was in high school, uh, I went to go play, play tennis with my friends. I never played tennis before, and they gave me a racket. I was terrible. Imagine that. I hit the ball, and the ball went <laughs> over the fence, into the net, and, it, and, it, and after, and I was playing these, these other people and these girls, and everyone was beating me, okay, because I couldn't get that ball over the net, okay, and I remember that night, I got home, and my mom asked me, so what did you do tonight, Danny? Oh, we had a church group. What did you do? Uh, we played tennis. You played tennis? Not really. Yeah. Um, it was terrible because I was terrible at it. Let me tell you something. When you're terrible at something, you have two choices. One choice is say, I'm never going to play it again. Okay? And what's your other choice? I like that, Sebastian. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to get better, and I'm going to learn. And that was my attitude because I could have said, you know what? I stink at this. I'm terrible at this. I'm never going to play this again. But I didn't, I didn't want that attitude. My attitude is, you know what? Mom, tomorrow, can you buy me a tennis racket? That's what she did. She went to Big Five. She got me this nice tennis racket. And then I practiced like three, four days a week. I go hit against the wall. I go to school. I practice and practice and practice. And guess what? One year later, I made the school team. Because I practiced so much. But you see something, guys? When things get hard, you always have two options, right? You always have two options when things get hard. Even in your spiritual life, in your Christian life, Christian life can get hard sometimes. Always have two options, right? You can quit or what? Or, or go and get work harder, right? And you get better. Kids, I don't ever want you to give up because things get hard. I want you to keep at it, because when you get at it, guess what? In the end, eventually, you get better and you get stronger, okay? So God bless you. You know what? Never give up, guys, okay? All right. That's my children's story for today. Enjoy. Go back to your seats, and we'll have the rest of the message today, okay? God now. Yeah, so yeah. if you'd like, you can kneel and uh, join me in prayer.
Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Holy is the name of your Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your loving care and want you to know that uh, we worship and acknowledge you as the creator and savior of all life and all things. Uh, with, all the, with all the turmoil that goes on, you can hardly turn on the TV without noticing it. I would like to thank you for one positive note. Um, it seems that it's been made harder to kill babies and, and newborns uh, through a, a law that was passed. And uh, I personally would love to thank you that, uh, that that came to be as an answer to my prayer and an and answer to a lot of other people as well. So, so thank you for that. Thank you for showing us that there is still hope in this world. Um, there are people uh, in the congregation that uh, have praises for you, and so we lift up all praises and say thank you, Lord, for all that you do. I do know that, that Roberta, Roberta has, uh, has gotten shingles. She is not the first one in this, uh, in this congregation to suffer with that particular disease. So we ask that you send the Holy Spirit, your, your healing powers, and that you, you uh, cause that virus to vacate her body immediately and for the... the uh, little things that shingles leaves behind to be healed quickly and uh, that she would be able to uh, join us again just as soon as possible. Thank you, Lord. And there are many other people that need your help as well, both uh, physically uh, because of disease, uh, spiritually, uh, those that are struggling. We ask that you, you send support, that you send the spirit to guide and lead and strengthen and point them in your direction, and uh, and those that have uh, mental health issues, if if that's uh, something that uh, that you struggle with, we ask that you clear their minds, that you uh, get all that chemistry up there working correctly, and uh, that you heal that part of them as well, so that they can focus on you and, and not uh, not have to deal so much with uh, with the other struggles. Once again, Lord, we thank you for all your loving care and that we ask that you uh, continue to keep us safe and well and protected and on the path that leads to salvation until we can meet again here in your house next Sabbath to worship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's see, we've got a slide working. There it is. Wonderful. You know, I've heard that in heaven, angels could sing in seven octaves or seven voice. It's just uh, harmonics that you would not even believe. Uh, um, music, it just reverberates all through heaven. Um, God, C.S. Lewis says, God is like music. It, it, it resonates with your soul. Doesn't music touch you? You know, it, it touches you places that other things can't. And, and um, I, I was reading a book. <clears throat> it was fascinating to me. He said, when a group, like a church body, sings together, and this is really cool, your heartbeats start to synchronize. Really cool. Your heartbeats will begin to synchronize and start beating as one, and it, it's and music does that. It, it's it's powerful. So when you come and sing together, I, I want to appreciate the the praise music, the 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 music leaders of our church uh, that play the piano and the guitar. When you're doing that, you're you're working with the Holy Spirit to bring His people together. In a, in, a, in a powerful way. And, and also, I believe the Sabbath is the same. I believe when... S Sabbath is not just another day. It's not just the seventh day of the week. No, it's not another... I believe this. This is... I can't prove this, but I believe this. That on the seventh day, there is music opened up from heaven. On a special day, it opens up on this day. And when we worship together... It can resonate in, in your heart. There's, it's not just a day of rest, but God is opening up heaven to us. 
that we could resonate with heaven in a way that the other six days you can't. This is a day that God has made, and let us be glad in it. And what a beautiful thing it is to have church, to have worship, and to praise God in a deep, harmonic, subconscious, spiritual way that we can't do any other time but today. So let us pray together and ask for the Spirit to bless us this day. Father in heaven, we ask for the Spirit to come and join us in worship. May you be praised and honored and glorified because you are God and we are your creation and we love you and we thank you for being with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yet to have attained. This is a picture of Magnus Carlsen. Some of you might know him. Some of you know who is that guy? Well, if you're a chess player, you know who he is. He's the He's a world champion. And not only that, he was world champion, I believe, at the age of 23. Um, he's one of the youngest, if not the youngest world champion ever to play the game of chess. Even at the age of seven, he was like a child prodigy. Okay? And he's been champion up to the age, now he's 32, and he's five-time world champion. Okay? He is that good of a chess player. I mean, he makes good chess players look really bad. That's how good he is. And for me, who was a chess player, I've always admired him and for his genius. There was a tournament and one time in, in, in Europe, and in this tournament, he played against other, I believe, 14 or 13 grandmasters. I mean, when I, when I say grandmaster, I'm talking about the top level chess players. And in this tournament, he went seven and one. He won seven games, he lost only one game, and he tied the other five games. He won the tournament. But as he was pros, <laughs> Magnus is amazing. He could tell you exactly how he lost that one game. He has the memory for it. I mean, you had to have something, right? And he could tell you exactly what move was made that lost him the game. He'd be like, oh, you know, I should have moved a pawn, but I moved a bishop, and it caught, he, 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 it's all in his brain. And to believe it or not, this is fascinating. If you lay out a chessboard and just lay out certain pieces, okay, that he played, he could recognize that. Like, even from 10 years ago. He goes, oh, yeah, that's uh, Germany. You know, I played that in game two, and yeah, I remember that. It, it, I go like, yes, I am not Magnus Carlsen. Um, but what fascinates me about Magnus is this. He's, he's brilliant. He, he's the best that it is. But when he loses, he studies it. He learns it. Because, because when he's learned and studied something, he can get better. I like that attitude. Because to me, when we have mistakes, when we have failures, when we lose, we often think, well, oh, we're no good. But we've, we've heard this before, haven't you? That losing, failure is our greatest teacher, isn't it? It's our teacher. It helps us get better. In Philippians 3, chapter 12, this is Paul, what Paul says. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection which Christ first possessed in me. Christ has given us an opportunity to grow. And this is what's the important thing to say, to grow. You see, many people have this feeling or this thought. I'm a Christian, but why do I fail? I'm a Christian, and why do I stumble? I'm a Christian, but why is life so difficult? I'll tell you why. Because you are unfinished clay. God is not done with you yet. You know, there's a terminology, you know, about Christians of being, hmm, Sad 
Christian. Some people say, Adventist, they would say. Because we're always failing in one way or the other. We're always tripping over our feet. And we go home and we're saying, we're not good at this. We're not good Christians. Have you failed this week? Did you do something you shouldn't have done this week? Have you <sighs> spoken words that you hurt somebody? I did. I see something going, oops, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Or, or sit, done things I shouldn't have done. And then we, we, we have to face God in the evening, don't we? And we pray to God, God, please forgive me because I have sinned. You know, being a Christian is not easy because sometimes we understand that there is a progression because we are unfinished clay. And this is very important because you have not attained it. Believe it or not, Christians are not Perfect. Can I say that? Christians are not perfect. But I'll tell you the beauty of this, though. Christians have the ability to be forgiven. Yes? And that's powerful. Our world is imperfect. And we've devised many ways of trying to feel that we're okay. I'm okay, you're okay, and just kind of kind of self-conceptualization and whatnot. But no, there is a best way to deal with imperfection. The best way of dealing with this, you come to the Lord and you admit your imperfection. You come to the Lord and say, I messed up today. And here's the beauty of it. God says, you are unfinished clay. I will forgive you. But here's, a, here's another beautiful part. I forgive you. Let's go on. I got plans for you. This is a, a, a disc, uh, a Frisbee disc. This summer, um, I had the pleasure of, of, of playing a new game with my son. My son is 20 years old, if you don't know him. And um, he doesn't have too many summers left, you know. And he's come from school, and I said, oh, what can I do with my son? And so I introduced him to disc golf, okay. It's a funny little game. You've probably never seen it. And if you don't know what it is, it's basically a Frisbee about this size. And they have these little baskets all through the park or uh, through the woods. And you throw this little Frisbee around. Okay, it's, it's, it's fun. You get to walk around and enjoy nature for a good hour. And we've enjoyed it. Now, the tough part about this game is that you ever throw a Frisbee? You throw it, and it just always goes, you know, it just goes sideways, right? In this game, you try to get it to go straight, and those, those things just don't fly straight. I think the discs are broken, okay? They just won't fly straight. So I, I throw it, and it goes, I'm like, ah, oh, okay? And once in a while, it'll go straight. I'm like, yes, it went straight this time. And I remember I was playing over there in uh, Buxton or something, and I, I threw this disc, and this disc, oh, man, the, 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 whole, the basket was here, and this disc went way over here, and it went into the water. And I was like, oh, no. And it was just in the edge of the water, and it was on this slope. And I was like, I don't want to lose my $20 disc. You know, I, I bought that disc. So I was going down in the, the, the little slope. I got there, and I had this stick, and I was pulling it and trying to get this disc. And I got the disc, and I finally got it, and it was all wet, this incline. And I was trying to get back up, and I was slipping, sliding, my shoes going into the mud. And I, I was like, oh. I finally got back to where I was supposed to be. I was like this. Like, <gasps> and I'm like, okay, I must be getting old. Okay? Because I was like, oh, this is hard. Okay? And what dawned upon me is this, that... I am out of shape. I, I mean, I, I, I need to do some more cardio or something, okay, because I'm out of shape. The reason I, I, I bring this up and the reason I'm telling this story is because of this. It says, fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many 
witnesses. And the first line, it says, fight the good fight of true faith. And I ask myself, if there is something going to happen in the future, okay? If. And, and we, we know that something's going to happen in the future, right? We know that, that tough events will be coming. But here's, here, here's what got my attention. We think that we're ready for whatever's coming, whatever trouble's ahead. But I wonder, are we prepared for the troubles ahead? When the troubles do come, are we ready for the challenges that will confront us? Or are we will be, here we go, out of breath, unprepared, not ready. We want to be ready. But my question to you this, this morning is this. Are you getting ready? I want you to notice a verse before this one, verse 11. I read 12, but look at 11. What is that fight of faith? But you, Timothy, oh, are a man of God. You guys are a man of God, women of God. So run from all these what? Evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with love, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. I was um, driving down, well, I was, you were, you probably noticed it. When you're driving down the street, you pull up to your stop sign and this car, black, lower, whatever that thing is, that sports car will drive up to you, and it's going boom, boom, boom. You know what I'm talking about? And, and me and my wife are like, man, that guy needs to put his radio down, okay? Um, but, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And I remember one time I, I pulled up to an intersection, and it was, he had his, he had his uh, window rolled down. I don't know what music that was. I can't. Okay, let me try to describe it to you. Ah, That's the best way I can describe it. Uh, It was just literally screaming for a minute, a whole minute. I'm just thinking, really? That's what they listened to. It was, I'm not kidding. It was literally screaming and yelling for an entire minute. And this guy's over there like, and and I was, and and I was thinking to myself, I don't think that gentleman next to me is at peace. Is that, is, that, is that a safe assumption? And here's another assumption. The music is very hard, very frantic, very angry, and very rebellious. And, and, I, and I think to myself, if we have that music, how can we be spiritual? in any form or fashion. Does that make sense? We can't. You can't do it. And and so that dawned upon me. Lucifer, the the master musician, he's the choir master, right? He knows exactly how to get humans not thinking about God. One of his best ways is music. And, And not only that, What I'm trying to get at is this. If Lucifer has a plan, his plan is this. Keep us weak. Keep our minds off the track. And keep us every which possible way to not be prepared for what's ahead. My friends, there is going to be a test ahead. There is going to be a summit to climb. There will be a summit to climb, but I'll tell you something. If someone told me right now, Danny, tomorrow let's go climb Mount Hood, I'm not going. I'm not. I'm not going. Would I like to go up to Mount Hood? That would be nice one day. But I've talked to people who climb Mount Hood. I'm not ready. Okay? You're talking about 11,000 plus elevation here. Okay? 
a whole lot of walking, a whole lot of incline, a whole lot of shoes and ropes and whatnot, okay? I'm not ready. If I want to climb Mount, well, Mount Hood, I'm not even going to say Everest, I need to get ready for it. I need to train for it. I need to prepare for it. My friends, I'll tell you something. something. We as Christians, we have something important coming. And this important event is this. Jesus is coming soon. Do you believe that? Jesus is coming soon. And when Jesus comes, this world will be split in two. The Bible says that. There will be the wheat and there will be the chaff. But let me tell you something. The wheat, they will be ready because they've been training. They've been fighting the good fight. They've been pursuing righteousness. Let's go back to the text. They've been running away from evil things. You know, people say, well, that's evil, that's wrong. You know, often young people will tell me, well, Pastor Danny, what's wrong with this? Or what's, what's wrong with this thing? Or why can't I do this? Many people say that. Well, what's wrong with this? Or what's wrong with this? And, and I try to tell them, it's not about what's wrong. God doesn't sit here and judge you because you're doing the wrong thing. You're, you're missing the point if you think it's wrong. Okay? God's not checking off the list saying, this is bad, you're a bad person. That, that's not the point. That's not how God works. What God is saying is this. When we do wrong things, when we do evil things or do evil entertainment or whatnot, it draws you away from God. Does that make sense? That's the point. It's not about you doing the wrong thing. When we do wrong things, it puts us farther away from his voice. We're less understanding of his leadership. We're more susceptible to weakness is of our character. My friends, as Christians, it's time to we prepare for the summit. It's time to train in all things, pursuing righteousness. We don't get... The same applies for the other side. It's not bonus points. God didn't say, oh, what a good person Danny was. You know? He didn't do this or he did. We need to get away from that narrative of you being a bad person or, or a good person. That's not the right narrative here. What God is trying to say, when we do evil, you become more and more less like God. Does that make sense? And you don't want God. And when we pursue righteousness, we want to be more like who? To be more like God. Does that make sense? And it says pursue righteousness and a what? Godly life. God is not concerned necessarily about you being a perfect person. What he wants you to be is more strengthened and prepared for the battle ahead. Putting on the armor of God. Putting on the faith of God. Fighting the good faith, along with faith, love, perseverance. Gent I love that. Gentleness. You want to know if you've, ex if you've come to the level of Christian walk? Gentleness. Because when the Holy Spirit's inside of you, you are at peace. You are at peace. In Philippians 3.14, the next verse says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Versus Philippians 3.14. You know, I've given many Bible studies. Many Bible studies to many people. Many non-Christians, many non-Adventists. And, and when I give Bible studies, you know what? They always agree with me. God is love. They love that. Okay? God forgives you. They love that. I mean, why wouldn't you, right? God is good. God loves you. God is gracious. And I, and I start talking about Bible prophecy. Well, that's cool, Pastor. That's cool to know that, you know, God has things under control, that we're, we're going places, and it's okay. And, and we talk about maybe stay the dead. We talk about how if you're dead, you sleep. Like, oh, that's a new one, Pastor. I didn't know that. Yeah, you sleep, you know? And when Jesus comes, he'll take you from the grave and well, that's cool. I could, I could deal with that, okay? But there is one particular Bible study is always a little bit of a stumbling block. Always the most challenging one, Bob. I'll let you know. That's the most challenging one. Guess what it is? Sabbath. 
99 Sabbath, I'm sorry, but I can tell you. 99% of the people agree that Sabbath is a good thing. I mean, who can argue with Sabbath, right? It's an opportunity to take a break from the world, right? We all need a break from the world. It's an opportunity to spend time with God. I could use a little more God, yes? It's an opportunity to get, get ready for church, sing songs, fellowship and community. What a wonderful thing Sabbath is, you know? And you get to rest from your work. And so people agree, they like that. But the difficult part is that they say, which day? The Sabbath day. What do you mean, the Sabbath day? Well, there's only one Sabbath day. And that's the day that God finished and ended his work. Does that make sense? And when God said, this is the day he made, it is the seventh day, not any other day. This is the seventh day. And the, the reason it's so challenging is because people have to make a change. They have to make a change. And it's hard to make a change. But believe it or not, people are slowly making that change. You know that? I've known some people now. They go to church on Sunday. God loves people who go to church on Sunday. Let's be clear. Okay? Let's be clear. But I'm finding out there are people and pastors who, who are resting on Sabbath. Because we're learning about the Sabbath. They'll take Friday night and Saturday night. They're, they're resting. And they still go to church on Sunday. God bless them. There's nothing wrong about going to church on Sunday. But they understand the Sabbath the rest that God has ordained, and they're resting on it. Because when I talk about Sabbath, it creates a life change. It creates an opportunity to act on something, act on what God has said. You, you hear me? Okay? And that's always kind of one of the most difficult things. And as Christians, I'll tell you something, one of the hardest things that we need to do is, here's the word, change. I'm not trying to point fingers or be accusatory. Please don't take me wrong, because I have the same challenges as you. But I need to talk about what the world is trying to do to us and how we need to resist the world. When it comes to your entertainment, when it comes to your news that you're consuming, when it comes to the food you are consuming, when it comes to the thoughts and the attitudes that you have in your heart, they are essential, and we need to align those things to God. Yes? My friends, being a, being a healthy person is not a salvational issue per se. Okay, let's not get caught up and saying, well, you eat this or don't eat that. Let, let's, okay, we need to get away from those terminologies, right? The goal is health, yes? What's funny to me is that people will say, I, I'm not going to eat this, but they won't exercise. They go together, okay? And some people, you know, I mean, you, if you live in L.A., you kind of don't know how to choice. You're going to breathe in terrible air. But Oregon, hmm. last week I went to Mount Rainier. Was it last week? When was it last week, honey? Went to Mount Rainier. Huh. Went to Mount Rainier. Was it last week or two weeks ago? Went to Mount Rainier and, and the mountains up there. I'm telling you, when you walk through those big trees, it's different. It's like, wow, it, it just feels different when you're walking through a just bunch of trees. It's just God knows what he's doing, yes? He knows what he's doing. And he wants us to be healthy. He wants us to have Sabbath. He wants us to filter things that, were, that will hurt us. Could it be bad music? I want to challenge you. Think about it. What is, how is music affecting you? Could it be bad movies? We make kind of excuse. Oh, I think that bad. I only saw 500 people die today in this one. It, it, I don't know. Is, 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 is it affecting us? Is it the books that we're reading? Or is it the news that we're reading? Because some of us are like, uh, we love, for some reason, just a bunch of catastrophes. 
I like watching all these catastrophes on the news. And God is saying, think about the good things. Let's press toward on the prize, the upward call in Jesus Christ. We have one goal, and that's that. Amen? I saw, I saw this. I was preparing my sermon. And um, if you've ever heard of the seven sins, uh, this is um, something that's produced by, a, I believe actually the Catholic Church actually kind of created this one. But uh, the seven sins are lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. That's the seven sins. But this is the seven sins of the digital world. I thought it was kind of fascinating. It says lust, we have tinder. If you don't know what tinder is, good for you. Okay? Um, but it's a dating app. Okay? But hold on, it's not even a dating app. It's just people getting together app. Um, um, gluttony, we have Yelp. Um, if you don't know what Yelp is, that's find your favorite food in a certain area. Uh, greed, we have LinkedIn, you know, because we've got to move up the ch food chain, right? Get better jobs. Uh, sloth, we've got Netflix. Uh, there's an hours and hours to consume on Netflix. Uh, wrath, you got Twitter. You want a bunch of angry people? Turn on Twitter. Um, they're constantly fighting on Twitter. Um, envy, here you go, Facebook, okay? You're con constantly thinking, man, her life is better than mine. You know, he's having more fun. Look at him, he went to Europe. Envy. And pride, Instagram. Look at me. Um, selfies, well, eh, I thought it was kind of cute. But I want you to understand something. All these things are trying to keep our focus away from the most important thing. Yes? When we fail to spend time with God, when we spend more time on Instagram, well, not more time, I think a lot of kids do, than spending even five minutes in the Word of God, it, it's changing us. Does that make sense? I mean, I mean, well, we have some teenagers. No guilt, okay? I'm not trying to shame any teenagers here. I have, I have teenagers. I get it, okay? But my son is just, He's just swiping but all day long. He's just swipe. What are you looking? At? Oh, TikTok. Just, 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 just swipe. Oh, he'll laugh. Oh, me. Oh, this way. Is it this way? I'm sorry. This way. Uh huh. Yeah, he's going this way. Uh, not this way. Right. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a noob. Okay. And he's just going through and and he'll spend hours just swiping. And then he'll get he'll get this weird alarm. Little, little alarm. Da -da -da -da, and he'll do this. Oh, what is that? Oh. It's just show everybody what I'm doing right now. Okay. And take a picture. And I'm like, this is a weird world. Okay, I am out of touch. I, I, I am out of touch. I, and my, my, my daughter, who's 23, says, Dad, you have no understanding. I, I, I go, and she, she says, I'm 23, and I don't even get these 13-year-olds. Okay? What, what they got going. Okay, Facebook, that's for old people. Okay, <laughs> that's for us oldies. Okay, they got other stuff going on. Okay, but what I'm saying is that they spend so much time there. But here's the thing, I, I, and, I, and I pray for this, my own children. Please, God, may they spend two minutes reading your Bible. You know, I'm just, you know, may they spend just two minutes just, just praying to you. You know, maybe just, man, I'm praying. If you're a parent, you just got to be praying for your kids. And when it's Sabbath, I can't tell them to go. I don't want to tell them to go to church. You, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're older now. And I pray, God, I, I just go, I just hope they go to church by themselves now because they're adults. I don't want to call them, are you going to church? You know, and um, this morning, yeah, I cheated. I, I looked at my phone, see where they were. Yeah, I track them, okay? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a parent, okay? I'm allowed to track them, right? I'm like, hey, they're both at church. It made me smile, you know? Um, but I didn't bug them. They just went on their own. And I said, I praise God, you know? They, they took it on their own to go to church. I didn't have to call them, hey, you going to church today? Um, 
I, you know, as a parent, I feel it makes me feel good. Because I want them to go on their own. But what I'm trying to say is this world is constantly trying to keep us away from God. They're constantly trying to keep us weak. You know what I'm saying? We're spiritually weak. We're not, we're not challenging ourselves. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what lies ahead. Philippians 3.13, my brothers and sisters, I'll tell you something. Christians fail. And you know what? Christians fail a lot. Okay, we fail a lot. You know why? Because we have a high calling. You get me? When, you have a, when your bar is really low, to be, to be honest with you, it's not that, he's not that bad. But as Christians, you feel like this. Don't you? Right? Because Jesus has set a pretty amazing bar. Okay? He has set a pretty amazing bar. But I'll tell you something. As Christians, this is very important to me. We have this. My little children... I am writing these things to you that you may not sin, or in this case, you may not fall. But, but, when you do fall, when you do trip, we have a what? We have an advocate. You know what an advocate is? Someone who steps in the middle, who pleads your case, and tells you, you're okay. Who's that advocate? Jesus Christ, the righteous. Here's the cool part. Christians fall, yes. I fall, yes. But here's the thing. Jesus steps in, because who's the accuser? Satan's the accuser. Remember that. It is Satan who accuses you. He'll tell you how bad you are. God never points fingers at you. Please remember that. Never. Please. Jesus is not an accuser. He does not tell you how bad you are or how many times you've messed up. That is Lucifer's job. That's what he does. He tells you that you're no good. He tells you that you are failing. He tells you that you've messed up again and again. You might as well give up because you're no good. That is the devil talking. Jesus never does that. Jesus says, are you okay? Are you all right? I still love you. Let's keep on going and don't give up. That's our God. That's Jesus Christ. He never accuses. He is our advocate. He's with you. He's there with you, and he understands everything you're doing. Here's the beauty of it all. Here's the beauty, and here's where the strength comes. Because the Bible says, when you are weak, then what? Then you are strong. I'll tell you something. There's a reason why Christians are strong. It's not because we're strong. It's because Jesus is our strength. And the more we rely on Jesus... When the difficult time comes and the end of time, you will be ready, not because you're strong in strength per se, you are strong in faith. And all the things that you are doing right now is building towards that. Every time you fall, every time you mess up, every time you say, I can't do it, Jesus says, yes, you can. My friends, we are growing. Hmm. I got oh, wrong, wrong pocket. I got a story somewhere. Oh, this is a story. This is, this is the other one. Schedule. This is a little poem about a broken toy. It's not a long poem, but I just want to read it to you. A boy sat down. He looked so sad. His toy had gone apart. He tried to fix it, but too bad. He just wasn't that smart. Oh, Father, help me, was his cry. Please fix this toy for me. My pleasure, my son, the quick reply as came, as he came close to see. The boy bowed down and tried anew, each time with greater zeal. But as the night drew close, he knew his failure was too real. Then he looked up and cried again. His, he says, my father, don't you care? You told me you would help me, but your hand was never there. My precious son, the father said, as he loved, bowed down. I waited here all afternoon while you tried it on your own. I could not fix your toy, you see, because you did not let it go. But give me, the, me, please, each broken part, and I will fix it now. 
so the story ended with a happy little boy who finally gave to all the to dad who fixed the broken toy. Have you, have you a broken story or a broken bleeding heart? Something that's too hard to fix or a dream that broke apart? Then give it to your father, that loving friend above. Just leave it to all in his big hands and trust his father's love. We can't fix ourselves. We don't get better by trying more. Remember this. We get better by trusting in Jesus. We do. It is Jesus that fixes us. It is Jesus that changes us. What we can give to our Father is this, our desire to change. I have a, I have a sweet tooth. I, I, you know, you probably know, or you probably seen me in there. I'm sorry about that. I have a sweet tooth. And uh, my wife knows. I love cookies and stuff. And, uh, and whenever I drive Cornell, uh, I see uh, sesame donuts. Right? I'm like, and my head always goes, Apple fritter, okay, um, and uh, I, I, and it's challenging not to make that that right turn into the driveway. Okay, I see sesame donut, I see the apple fritter calling my name. Okay, and I and I and I really pray to God about this, and and I said, God, this sugar stuff is no joke. Okay, it is no joke. It is not a joke. It's, it's not easy to kick sugar. You, once you get addicted to sugar, it is, man, I, I don't know what drugs feels like, but sugar is a drug. Okay? And I pray to God, God, I need, I need help here. I, I really need help here. You know? And this is a bargain that he made with me. He could have, he's, 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 a, he, well, he's a kind God to me. He said, you could have one apple fritter a month. One, and uh, I, I, that's next week, okay. Uh, uh, and 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 I and but here, but, but I ask God, God, if we can go on this plan, I need you to help me be strong. You know, resist it. And you know what? Because you have these urges, right? Here's the cool part: God has helped me with my urges. You know, it's really it's really cool. That I'm not a slave to sin. I'm not a slave to sugar. I could, I could drive by a sesame donut and not go in. That's an accomplishment. That's a win. Really, that's a win. And that win is all God. Okay? Because he had to change me in the inside. Because I have selfish desires. And when I have selfish desires, who do I go to? I go to God. Right? Because God can change me, right? And that's the power of God. He could change you, and he could help you with whatever you're struggling with. And here's the cool part. If you're struggling with Jesus, praise the Lord, that means you're hanging on to him every step of the way. You hear what I said? I hope you fail. This is pastor talking. I hope you fail a lot. I say these words because of this. Because when we fail, I hope you can trust Jesus. Because he's the one who'll get you home. We are an unfinished product. But Jesus sees a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. You don't even know what you are yet. You know, these, I've seen these people on TV, like, I want to know who I am, what I am. Oh, no one knows, but God does. He knows exactly who and what you can be and what you need to be and how to get you there because you are a masterpiece. And I can't wait. I can't wait to be a better pastor. I can't wait to be a better husband. I can't wait to be a better friend. I can't wait to be, I just want to see what God could create in me because you are a masterpiece. And if you let God finish the good work in you, you will become, man, something amazing. Don't let sin sell you short. You know what I'm saying? Let God form the creation that he's created in you. In Psalm 51, 10, I'll end with this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a new heart. Create in me new desires. I need new desires. Yes? I want new desires. I want new impulses. I want to do the, here's the word, the right thing. I want to do what God wants me to do. And God wants that too. My friends, Jesus is coming. You will be ready because God will get you ready. You will be strong. You will be prepared because Jesus has a plan for every single one of you. Don't give up. Keep on pressing forward. God is victorious, and he will get you home. Don't ever quit. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for an opportunity to come this morning to listen to your word. Lord, there are tough things coming, but Lord, it's okay because you got our backs. There are many failures in our lives, but it's okay because you love us, you care for us, you forgive us, you heal us, and you set us forward, and you change us, Lord. What a victorious God we have. Be with our church. Let us trust you. Let us lean on you for all things. And may you be the victory in our lives. May we be transformed by your love and your grace. We ask for the Holy Spirit to continue to be with us this week. Watch us and guide us. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Have a gracious week. And we'll see you guys next Sabbath. God bless.